This is Capsule on LiveInLimbo.com. My name is Sean Chin. And I am Andreas Babiolakis. This is an insight into pop culture, film, and music, and the like. And because we don't have any interviews scheduled for today, I figured that we might as well just keep things consistent because, look, it's March 1st. We've been going for over two months now, considering it's a day after. Anyways, and why not keep things consistent, have a few podcast per week. So why don't we take a look into what's happening in the entertainment industry and just happening in general. And it's just as cold as it was when we started at the beginning. <laughs> uh, if anything, it's worse. I think capsule is the reason why the weather is still the way it is because a capsule contains things and it's containing the weather. So apologize to everybody in the world. It's our fault. Oh, man. <laughs> now we're going to get all the hate mail and death threats and all of that good stuff. Well, at least your podcasts are interesting. Uh, that's like right. That's, that's correct. Uh, nonetheless, a few days ago, Sean Chen got to interview Sky Sweeten. I mean, Sever. Um, famous oh, sumo, sumo Psycho, yes. Yeah, exactly. Famous Canadian singer. And I didn't. It's not because I didn't want to. But right before we were able to interview her... My internet started to cut out, and I thought it was me, so I reset my router, I reset my computer, reset Skype millions of times, but then it wasn't me, because it still wouldn't work. So I went through my phone to check up online through data, and apparently Rogers itself was actually having technical issues. So because of their technical issues, I actually didn't get to interview her. So this got me to thinking about our dependency on technology and not even just the fact that we are so stuck on our computers and we bring our telephones to the the bathroom just so we can't be bored. But even within the entertainment industry itself, it got me to thinking about music, for instance, especially with new stations coming out all the time like Indie 88.1 that just came out at the start of this year. What I find interesting, Sean, is that we've always been dependent on technology. It's not just a recent thing. But for instance, look at the radio itself. Where do you find most of your music, for instance? Right now or like? In, or right now. Right now I use um, RDO. There you go. See, if you're not using the radio, you're using something else. Like you can't just discover things out of thin air. Well, how Be did my, people do it before? That's the thing. That's why we've been dependent. What, when did this pop culture and this new generation of music start? It started around the 50s and the 60s when it was being broadcast and distributed to us through the radio, for instance. And we've always had that. Then again, like back in the Renaissance era and the like, when we had composers, they, they were known of because they were spread. And I guess you can consider horse travel technology (laughs) well i guess so i guess back then they would have like a orchestra and a concert and then they'd get everyone talking and then you'd actually have to go to their show and then you'd buy whatever they had there no i don't think they had anything to buy you just listen to their music yeah you didn't have anything to buy i mean if you look at the film um amadeus you see f murray abraham's character just like reading mozart sheet music and it's playing in his head we can't do that now we we'd have to actually hear it because we've been fed all of this information we can't just think like think outside of wait so you're making it sound like a bad thing (laughs) that we're dependent yeah um yes and no because of course it's good that we have all this information and all of these resources now but at the same time now i feel that we've become a little bit lazier like you, for instance, maybe not because you still try and use other sources, but you're still confined to these sources. It's like this philosophical statement that when people say, we are free to choose what we want, we're still limited to what we're choosing. Do I want Coke or Pepsi? I choose Coke because I'm free. Are you really free or are you just free within the confinements of what you're being given? You know what I mean? I drink water. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Still, like, how many well, other right, drinks? Right you now, you can, like, still buy CDs. You can still buy vinyls. You can uh, download tracks, and you can stream music online. There's a whole variety of things you can do. For sure. And it's, of course, that's good, because at the same time, as your options are branching out, you're still being kind of stuck. Like, what if, for instance, Amazon one day started to crash, and you couldn't get 
the music that he wanted, or iTunes started to act up, and you couldn't get the music that you wanted to. And let's just say, like, Lord, your favorite singer, released a new song that day, and you couldn't hear it because all the websites were crashing because of either too many people trying to listen to it at once, or maybe it's Armageddon and the world's ending. But um, the fact is, like, you wouldn't be able to access these things because you'd be cut dependent on them that you don't know any other way. I'm sure if that happened, there would be other issues, like worse issues to be worried about at that moment. If that happened, that that would mean like an asteroid hit like every single server in the world. Well, that was that was that was a hyperbole statement. <laughs> L- listening to the new Lord track might not be the highest concern of mine at the moment. Well, what kind of a fan are you? No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean, though. I know what you mean. No, like okay, let's not take what I said too literally, but let's just say that there was an issue, like. Like I said, maybe there's an overabundance of people trying to listen at once, and it crashes. Like, for instance, My Lady Valentine, who is my actual favorite artist, released a new album after o- over 20 Actually, years and, last and, year. And just to be clear, Lord is not my favorite artist. No, I know. That, okay. That's why I had to emphasize the fact yeah. that they actually okay. are <laughs> my favorite artist. Um, they released an album after 20 years of promising and leading up. And like 10 years ago, Kevin Shields said, if I don't release an album this year, you have got every right to kill me and he somehow wasn't killed um (laughs) but he finally or they finally released the album online as a surprise and people who waited years and years and years for this thing just came on all at once to hear this album and within two hours of it being on online maybe two people in the world apart from the band and producers and all all of them themselves actually did hear it because the site kept crashing and it kept freezing and Mm -hmm. it processed it kept like it kept canceling the orders because it just kept acting up and people were furious like that's dependency people were actually furious i my myself wasn't furious i was like okay this is going to come out soon whatever but people were actually furious saying kevin shields you're an effing idiot and just like threatening to kill him because they couldn't hear their album within like a minute and that's dependency that's the kind of the society we're in where people people actually are losing it over small things. It's like this Louis C.K. bit, I don't know if you've heard it, where he says that people are just impatient over this like over the silliest things. And like for phones for instance, if something starts freezing on your phone, like you the go fact, nuts. Yeah. Exactly. The fact that you have you heard this bit or no? No, I I have. But like even if I'm without my phone for like half an hour or if my phone is a meter away from me, I will start to lose it. <laughs> yeah. Unless I mentally prepare for it before, like when I travel. Exactly. And I mean, like what he says is right. The fact that we even have phones that could do all of these things is amazing. How many years have we been saying we need video phones? We need phones that could do all these things. The fact that we haven't even said, oh my God, we have video calls. Who's actually full out said that? That this dream that we've had since the 50s has become a reality? No one. Instead, we're upset because there was a bit of lag on Angry Birds and your aiming was a bit off and you missed the pig. So, and what he said was right. The fact that you have to send these signals up to space and have it come back down. People forget these kinds of things, but we're actually grossly addicted to, to these technologies. Even so, where you and myself are dependent on the fact that we have to have interviews through Skype, which we've had We've had interviewees comment before. It's actually pretty inventive and, and really cool. But nonetheless, if something craps out, it craps out. Yeah, exactly. And for the, rec- for the people that are not from Canada, Rogers, which is the one that crashed on, which, which failed on Andreas that day, is a Canadian ISP, and all of them are pretty bad in Canada. All right. So, the world help us. <laughs> Rogers isn't a group of people named Roger or anything like that. Yeah. <laughs> I should have clarified. I forgot. Actually, that. have you, have you, when you mentioned that no one actually said, hey, we have phones that can do video, have you ever seen the, when Steve Jobs like unveiled FaceTime? Actually, haven't, no. No, well, I'll link that in the show notes. But he, I think I'm going to say he's the one that says, oh, hey, look, we can do this now. We have like Jetson technology right now. Well, that's that's the thing about Steve Jobs. You can love him, you can hate him. He's always been good at selling. And if anybody does like didn't forget these kinds of dreams that we had, it's him. Did he invent them? I don't know. It's, no, he did not invent exactly. them. Exactly. But he executed them well. That's the thing. He he's the reason why Apple's doing so well is because he knows or he knew rather 
Um, he knew the dreams that people had. He knew like how to remind people. Like when Bill Gates tried to release a tablet back in 2002 and nobody nobody grabbed for it. I guess like maybe the execution wasn't nearly as good, but when Steve Jobs tried to release it, he said, again, dependency, this is what you need. If you can't function with smaller phones, that's the thing. We didn't have smartphones and the like back in 2002. So a tablet now is much more effective because it isn't a smaller computer. It's a bigger phone. And so continuing on with the dependency on technology, it's rumored that Apple is going to be releasing their iOS in the car feature next week on uh, Volvo Mercedes and Ferrari. Wow. So, so as soon as you sit in your car, your phone, your iPhone or iPad will take over the car and like you can uh, do hands free texting and whatever. You can call up music and all of that. Wow. That's pretty cool. Actually, is it going to work with cloud or I have no idea. We have no idea. We'll see next week. You know, they don't like to release uh, secrets and stuff like that. But we will see. I'm sure it will be great. I want it in my car. I hope it's like an aftermarket console so I don't have to buy a Ferrari, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like no, you can, you can pull that. out the center console of your existing car and then put in the iOS in the car thing. That would be useful. I would not mind that, actually. I would buy that. And then also with the dependency again. So like on music, what we were initially talking about. So iTunes wants more exclusive artist albums remember like when beyonce released um, her exclusive with them like a few months ago yes and they sold an unprecedented eight hundred and thirty thousand albums in the first three days in 104 countries they want more of that exclusiveness i guess to give more um options to people well that's that's good i mean and it might they might emphasize on the fact that artists can release their own albums in a similar way that Beyonce did, right? Yeah. That'd be nice. That's like another avenue that they can go down. And it's nice. I hope, I hope so because, look, I'm not a big fan of Beyonce or anything, but her self-titled album is actually pretty damn good. I'm, I'm impressed. Yeah. And then I, but the issue with that was that Walmart was like, no, we're not going to carry the physical version because you favored iTunes over us. <laughs> and that, that's stupid because... That's because of people's dependencies. This is um, going on to the whole thing with like how marketing works. Now it's seen as a competition as opposed to a celebration, which is annoying because Beyonce wasn't the first person to do this, wasn't the first person to make a visual album. But it's important when a mainstream artist like that, who's on top of the world, does this kind of thing because that okay, is a celebration. Exactly. That's the thing. And now you have. You have corporations like Walmart basically taking a dump on it, saying, well, "Now this is this is a fight because we wanted to sell your album, this and that, and now you're you're favoriting." Well, no, because the fact that iTunes was was an initial release goal, right? That that's what was much easier to do. Like you, to have it just released in stores instantly as a surprise, it's virtually impossible. The people dealing in the stores would have would have released it. They would have been like, "Guys, what is this?" Yeah, they would have had a box like two weeks before or something, and then they'd open it, and then you'd see like Instagram photos of it. Exactly, and that would ruin the whole surprise. That would ruin everything. And the fact that it's a it's actually a video album. I don't know if people have actually checked out all of the videos, but you know, like not all of them are like mind blowingly impressive. But the whole the whole project itself is really nice. I it's a lot of effort was put into this. Did you dance? I don't dance, period. But in your room when no one's watching you. Did you dan- dance to it? Uh, moving on. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm going to guess that's a yes. Moving on. So um, if you haven't checked that out, actually do check it out. It's surprisingly really, really good. I mean, like, yes, she's talented and everything, but this probably is her best release thus far, like by far. And speaking of reviews and albums, you you reviewed... Um, St. Vincent's self-titled album, and you gave ah, it yes. a 9.2 out of 10. Speaking of self-titled, yes. What is the point two for? The point two. Uh, I think I've described this before. I don't know. I'll, um, I'll try and describe it again. Basically, for me, I don't like just giving things a concrete number. Um, now, I'm not going to go within double like digits. 9.23? Yeah, I'm not going to do that because that, that's... <laughs> That's stretching it, but I kind of like having it on on a real scale out of a hundred. 
but 100 is when it gets unattractive, when it's like 88 out of 100, I, I think. Unless it's something like Rotten Tomatoes or Metacritic, when it's like a huge collective of all of these scores, right? From one person, it seems kind of daunting. So just to have a decimal, because I do think there's a difference between a 9 and like an almost perfect, but it just missed the mark. You know what I mean? Yeah. So in this case, the whole album itself was like instantly for me a 9. Because it was just fantastic. It's catchy. It's moving. It's short and sweet. It's pretty experimental. Well, it's not. I've, obviously, I've heard more experimental things, but for somebody who's trying to kind of get out there within the music industry, it's still got a lot of quirks in it. Um, lyrically, it's just fantastic, as she's always been. Annie Clark, from who is also known as Saint Vincent, of course, um, it, always, always fantastic with her lyricism because it's funny it's dark it's peculiar and it's just really well written like every single time she's written something i've yet to see a lyric that's kind of stood out as being obnoxious or pretentious so the point too in this case comes from the odd song that has just a very fantastic moment that kind of like that kind of sat in for me like um i prefer your love which so far is one of the best tracks i've heard all year never mind on this album um, you prefer I, my love? Yeah. Mine? Like No, I prefer your love. Her her song, not you're not talking to me. No, I'm not. Oh, uh, damn it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um I think there are things that should be left uh, off the air. No. Um Is that your favorite track from the album? I would think I would say so, yes. It's a very That will be linked to in tracks. the show notes. Oh, fantastic. I think more people should hear it. It's better in context though because a lot of the album is quirky it's metallic sounding it's very alien and science fictiony if that's a word but then you have a song like this which is just it's very calm it's very ethereal but it's not it doesn't sound fake you know when a lot of artists will just add a string instrument like remember when you remember stained <laughs> stained yes yeah. oh wow it's been a while um no pun intended <laughs> Stained, like when Stained would put string instruments in their songs, it just felt so phoned in. It just felt so fake and like, oh, we have to be ambitious. We have to evoke emotions. Let's put in some violins. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, when you do something like that right, and it does add like a lot of relaxation and breathing space, it's, it just works wonders, especially on an album. And that, within the middle of the album, is fantastic. I remember um, somebody online actually was saying, oh, I love the whole album, except for I Prefer Your Love. That's such, it's like her worst track yet. So I was kind of dreading it when I was reaching that point. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I don't want to hear this song. And that then could it be surprised the you. It, absolutely. I was like, what is this guy talking about? This is, this is a fantastic track. I mean, she's tried for, to, like, to get that sound before um, on a variety of tracks on her other albums, but I think this is the way that she's done it her best. It's just, it's so relaxing it's so soothing lyrically it's so bewildering it's it's a fantastic track so you have you have these moments that just punctuate the album like that from because it's a really consistent album i i think but then you have moments like uh, prince johnny you have um, again i prefer your love and um various other moments on the album that just they hang with you for so long that it i just felt like it it garnered like so it garnered a little bit more than just a straight nine yeah, well, other people have given it like perfect tens, which I don't think any album deserves. Um, I think some albums deserve it. I don't know if it is a perfect ten because if there's always a point where I say, okay, this could have been done a little bit better, even if it's a great track, or if I would have done something differently, then that's fine. Yeah, then I don't. I wouldn't consider it a perfect album just because I really enjoyed it. Now, if I looked at an album like My Bloody Valentine's Loveless or The Velvet Underground's The Velvet Underground and Nico. I wouldn't want to change anything on those albums just because they give me such like such an array of emotions, such an array of feelings that there's just so many things happening. Like on those albums, every time you listen, it's a different experience. I, I don't even know how you can even achieve that. Those are perfect albums in my opinion. All right. That's pretty cool. That's a good insight right there. Well, what would you consider your favorite album then? Oh, of all time? Like a 10 out of 10 album? Well, you don't consider anything perfect, right? But like, what yeah. would you consider like your favorite then? Okay, they're both um, 
Radiohead albums. One is uh, OK Computer and one is Kid A, and they're very different from each other. Kid A, I would consider a perfect album. Yes. And OK Computer, I'm not as big on as people as other people are. I do love it, but I would give it I would give it a high rating, but I don't know if I'd consider it perfect. Sorry, guys. Yeah, well, whatever. <laughs> I also like um, Untitled by Sigaros, you know, like the two bracket one. Oh, that I album. think that's a very underestimated album. Yeah, I love that album. I Oh, the last track, um, Untitled 8. It's... <laughs> Untitled 8, yeah, that's what they call it. <laughs> I think they have titles, though. Um, I can't, pronou- I can't, I can't, I can't pronounce any of them. Exactly. Um, that song, that I think it's in oh. English, it's called the pop song. I yes, can't that's right. Yes. Is it? Yeah, I um, think so. The drumming at the end of it is one of my favorite drumming moments on that any was, album. It was, apoc- that, uh, it was like an apocalyptic kind of song, right? Oh, yeah. Like it starts yeah. off soft and it just builds Boom. up and gets heavier yeah. and heavier. Oh, it's... When I show people that song, they say, what? Sigur Rós made this? <laughs> like it's, I, I told the new album came out, obviously, because that was very dark for them. But no, no, yeah, it's that album stuff. was really great. I love that one. It's a great album. Yeah, I, I, I thoroughly enjoy it. Again, I don't know if I would call it perfect, but like even like OK Computer, just to go back on that, I don't consider it a bad album. I think it is a pretty fantastic album. I just don't know if it resonates with me as much as it does other people. I mean, Kid A was something where Every single time I listen to it, I you, feel something different. And you I find new goodies good. there all the time. Yeah, and it's not like the album's changing. It's just how I feel and my perceptions of it are always changing. I'm just how do they do sounds. that? How did they do that? That's a good question. I actually don't know because it's kind of like with a film. Cracked, um, Cracked.com, which I'm sure everybody knows at this point, who's ever been a student and wanted to procrastinate. Cracked.com brought up a really interesting point about bad films. You don't know that they're bad making them. Because there are just so many things happening at once that you've got the writing, you've got the acting, you've got the directing, the, the lighting, the cinematography, the music, the editing, just everything. I don't know if I repeated something, but um, just everything happening at once. There are just so many factors. So what about, the, what about the polar opposite? How do you know it's going to be a good film? Which is why directors like uh, Martin Scorsese and Ingmar Bergman and Woody Allen, I don't know how they, how they found these ways to make such timeless films i don't understand so then when you have the same thing with music well music it's a little bit easier to maybe think because well the albums that we've listed let's think about them we i i listed loveless which is shoegaze um i listed velvet underground and nico and nico which is very very noise based um and then you listed kid a and even even um okay computer a lot of these have soundscapes that are done really really well a lot of them experiment with just walls of sound. So each time you listen to them, I'm guessing you're listening to diff- different ways that different instruments and sounds are playing off each other. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. No, that's a good point. So on an album, or on a song maybe like uh, National Anthem on Kid A, it has all these jazz instruments just going haywire and crazy. So not do you even think a- that's how they make you feel different emotions when you are yourself in different moods? Because Most maybe they catered to everything in a subtext. Most likely, because if you look at if you look at music, which is considered bubblegum pop or just like it's very, very linear. superficial. Yeah, it's linear. It's it's a it's a beat, it's a melody, and it's a, and it's a vocal. Like you basically get what you're what's given to you. Whereas again, like national anthem, there are just so many things happening at once. Like, okay, we I talked about it before, Captain Beefheart, and um. <laughs> Trap Mask Replica. The creator of The Simpsons, Matt Grenning, actually said it's his favorite album, but the first time he, like the first six times or whatever he listened to it, he thought it was like the worst thing he's ever heard until it clicked. Yeah, I had to listen to Kid A maybe four times to get it. Yeah, and it's not because it's too smart for you or anything. And what's your favorite song on Kid A? Good question. Um... Good question. Maybe motion picture soundtrack. Yeah. I was confused. Exit's, Exit song for films on OK Computer, right? I was confused those two songs. Yeah, yeah, I, got it, yeah. I got it right, I think. Um, Idiot, Idiotech is one of my favorite songs ever. Oh, yeah. Everything in its right place is also fantastic. Yeah, no, that, well, like, yeah, that whole album is great. <laughs> so it's going to be hard to choose out one particular song. In Limbo, not because of the site we're on, but yeah. In Limbo is actually a fantastic track too. I think that was one of the first tracks. That and Optimistic were the two first tracks that kind of got me. And into I think I mentioned it before, but In Limbo is in between Idiot- 
idiotic and um, optimistic. Do you pronounce it idiotic or idiotic? See, I, I, I call it both. I like depend. What do you call it? I, I would just, I've just been calling it idiotech all these yeah, years. Yeah, idiotech is fine too. I thought it was just like a portmanteau. Yeah, it can go either way. But I call it idiotech most of the time. I guess so. So what, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about, um, let's go on to TV shows. Oh yeah, you want to talk about heroes? Heroes, yeah. And there's a lot of sequels going on right now. Like I'm watching a uh. handful of them. Not sequels, but like, you know, like, As we speak, like right now, you're watching this pickle. <laughs> uh, like a uh, person of interest. I love that show. Have you heard of it? Oh, of course I know person of interest. My, yeah, my Jonathan L- Nolan. What? My dad loves that show. Yeah. yeah. Jonathan Nolan writes it. I, I, that's like one of the best shows on TV right now. You think and so? Then, yeah. And then we have um, The Walking Dead. That's not, I'm watching that. And Game of Thrones will be starting up again, I think, next month. Game of Thrones is really good. I love all of them. All, all three of those are awesome. Like, Person of Interest is, like, super high up there because it actually started maybe, like, a year before this whole NSA thing blew up. And now it's, like... Right. Yeah. It's very relevant, actually. You're super relevant. Point. Scary. That it, it's, it could probably be happening. <laughs> like 1984, like we discussed with public Even worse than 1984. 1984 is nothing now. Exactly. exactly. It's, like, like way we beyond about, this. Well, I remember when we talked about it with public broadcast announcement. Yes. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's, it's a reality. Public, uh, per- public service broadcasting. See, that's what I said at first. And then, uh, uh, my bad. <laughs> PSB. PSB, there we go. My apologies. I'm, I'm going off notes here. <laughs> but anyways, um, speaking of relevant shows and, and whatnot, I thought there were more people that watched Mad Men. I, I'm, I didn't get into Mad Men too much. I didn't like it that much. Well, I'm sure it was a great show. Oh, you've got to give it time. It really picks up, and it's it's going on to its final season, which it's doing the same thing as Breaking Bad. It's splitting it into two, mm-hmm. so it'll officially end next year. But it's still going to be like one season. But what do but, you think of Person of Interest? I think it's a good show. It's I don't know if I like show. it as much as you do, but <laughs> how how can you not like it? I, I do like it. That's the thing. I just did you I watch the last I... episode? It's so suspenseful. I haven't so, watched it yet. No, like, I haven't seen a bad episode of it yet. That's the thing. I haven't seen a bad episode of it yet, but it's not like it's not like Breaking Bad or again Mad Men that just completely blew me away. Maybe because you're not a nerd like me that appreciates all the technology that goes on behind. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, but I, I'm always appreciative of what the Nolan brothers do because I always think everything that they do has some sort of interesting aspect to what they're doing. And so you wanted to talk about heroes, uh, just briefly because did I'll, you like the original series? I didn't really care for it, no. Oh, but okay. I just I just wanted to talk about the mixed reaction to the fact that it is returning. If you don't know, Heroes is returning. I'm not making that up. Um, With the original I, cast? I probably, don't know, actually. It might be. Probably not. Maybe not. I don't know. Like, I liked the first season, and the second one was okay, and then it went downhill after that. Like, seriously. Did you it's, watch it? A uh, little bit. Even like the first season, I didn't really get into it that much. I didn't really care for it too much. That's about it. No. That's, <laughs> it. <laughs> That's about it for me. But I, because I'm not a big fan of Heroes, I wanted to take it from my own perspective. Six Feet Under is my favorite show. I think I've talked about this before. What if Six Feet Under returned? Or maybe that's a bad example because... Seven Feet Under. Uh, well, no. <laughs> I think it's... I think that's a bad example. I don't want to give anything away because it's pretty finite. But what if something like, uh, let me think, Seinfeld came Gilmore back. Gilmore Girls. Well, no, I didn't watch Gilmore Girls. Oh, man. <laughs> um, I've heard it's actually good. I don't know. I've, I've heard mixed things about it. I, I might check it out one day. But Which one, Gilmore Girls? Yeah. Oh. No, I love Seinfeld. I love oh. Seinfeld. That's why I brought it up. If Seinfeld came back, where it's not like it's a finite ending, nothing can happen afterwards. If Seinfeld came back. They came back it, for the Super Bowl. Te- technically, but you know what I mean. Like, if it came back as a show, oh. it, like they got out of jail or whatever, and it's still called Seinfeld, and it's just them now, how would I feel about it? I I wouldn't I wouldn't like it to be honest. So did that show end off with them in jail? Yeah. Oh, so maybe they can do like a movie like The Shawshank Redemption. See, but see, I wouldn't like as that. a comedy. I wouldn't like that though because it ended exactly the way that it should have because they're a bunch of lunatics and a bunch of really unlikable people they ended where they should have i don't want to well it's 
bit late now because if you've not watched Seinfeld, now you know. But <laughs> it basically ends. Spoiled because, it. <laughs> yeah, well, it basically ends because a bunch of people that they cross paths with within the show basically di- didn't give them any remorse, so they just ended up in jail without any alibis or anything. So um, that's about it. And would I want it to return? No. Would I want Six Feet Under to return? No. I think the problem is. Well, obviously you see it in films. We talked about sequels before, but with TV shows, the fact that they are reoccurring, they will be back next season unless they're canceled. People just want more, and they they aren't happy. Again, dependency. They aren't happy with just a finished product. Like, the whole thing with Dexter. I don't want to give away the Dexter ending, but it's pretty hilarious, actually. Like, it's a terrible, terrible ending. And people are still saying... Oh, this is their way of bringing Dexter back. That's going to be rebooted. What? What is the point? If it failed, it failed. Just keep it as is. It's a failed experiment, like Homeland. Would I want them to fix up and reboot Homeland? No. It's the fact that it's going downhill. It's it's its own fault. But I like the fact that it's still tried, right? And I don't think a show should come back. In all honesty, even if it, Freaks and Geeks is one of my favorite shows, and that got canceled after a season. Would I want it to come back? No. Because- why? Why is Freaks and uh, Freaks and Geeks everyone's? Why is it everyone's favorite show? I, I liked it? it too. Yeah. I, no, I've seen it. But is it I because think- it's only one season? That's why everyone likes it because there's no more. No, I think um, people wanted more from it, right? Obviously, because well, they demanded more. But I, I think most people agree that if it came back now, that they're old, like it's they're much older, it would be stupid. Yeah, it would be stupid. Yeah, like the cult came back too late. Um, now, it's I think well I like it because it's a, it's the best rendition of anything high school related I've ever seen. I love the fact that it isn't just all pretty. Like um, wait, it was better than Student Bodies and Breaker High. Yeah, oh. by far. Okay, by far. yeah. I liked it because it was real. It didn't always sugarcoat things. Like <laughs> Nick Nick Andopoulos, for example. Like you remember his drumming audition, right? Yeah. Most other TV shows would have been like, oh. It was bad. Wait a second, I got the call. I'm in the band. That's so nice. But he didn't. It was real. It was great. I'm a failure as a drummer, and now I'm probably going to be sent to the army because I can't make it in school. It, it, was a, it was a real, real show. And the fact that it wasn't just depressing or just happy, it was a mixture of the two. It, like, I just liked the way that it took its audience seriously. And because of it, you got to like all these people. They weren't stereotypes. They weren't... Um, they weren't shoes that you just put on. They were just a lot more than that. They were real people. And like, look at like the geeks, for instance. Um, like when they discovered the first adult movie or whatever, right? There wasn't a funny, nerdy response to the fact that they found an adult video. It was a very real response to the fact that they were still like really young people. That, and they didn't know how to respond to it. They reacted any other way that anybody in the world would have reacted to their first kind of experience like that. It was like discovering cooties all over again. It was this weird feeling, and they didn't know how to react to it. That's Freaks and Geeks in a nutshell. It was just a very real experience, and it showed that no matter your age, even if your parents or what cliques you were a part of, you were all pretty much the same person, and you had the same experiences. Yeah, I totally agree. But like... <laughs> Yeah, I think art forms, when they finish, they should just stay finished and not try to dig them up from their grave again just for the sake of making more money off it. Case in point, Marshall Mathers Part 2. I'm sorry if you like that album, I just... That was a sequel. Basically. That was a bad analogy. (laughs) Well, it it was bringing back Slim Shady from the dead, essentially, because... um, Well, he killed off Slim Shady, apparently, in Encore, right? So... It was bringing back all these past stories that Slim Shady encountered, right? Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> uh, that's stretching it. Okay, let's look at a good show that I actually do hold dear to me, Arrested Development. Oh, yeah. Do I think season four was a failed attempt? No, I actually like it, but it's, it's not the same. It isn't the same at all. Like, yeah, it's not even close. Why can't people just leave, let things be? I don't know. I'm, they always want more. Yeah, we're all to dependent be honest, on it. Like, I'm glad that they did attempt... And they did try their hardest with season four because there is still so many, so many references. And the fact that it doesn't work the same way as the first three seasons, the fact that it is like one big long story through multiple perspectives, 
it's I think it's still really clever, but the fact that each episode is dedicated to each character and it's not like each episode is just all of the characters playing off one another. It's not the same. Did you ever watch the show Fringe? I love Fringe. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So man, you like you watched the whole thing, right? Oh, it's yeah. Fantastic. I love that show too. That was that's one of my favorite shows ever too. But you remember how it was supposed to end? Like they they thought they were gonna get canceled, and they got like shifted sh- shifted around all these different um, uh, time slots th- right. throughout the week, and like they were on the verge of being canceled. So then they had like an ending for season four, but then yeah. they got renewed for season five to like formally finish it off i think they did a very great job at that i'm I'm really glad because at least that's what i think should happen okay if your show is not doing as well as you think no but it was it was it was not doing well like in general like super blockbuster numbers but people loved it like the people that watched it like really 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 loved it yeah like me of course and (laughs) me and me too yeah it was a great show but i think more shows like that should be given like a final chance to wrap things up. I mean, even Dexter, when it was like failing, was given a chance to wrap things up, and it failed. Yes, but at least at least it got a chance. Something like Freaks and Geeks or um, Twin Peaks weren't really well. That rhymes. Um, they weren't really given a good chance to wrap things up. So Twin Peaks, you have this cliffhanger that's just because it's david lynch and it's open ended it's not just open ended it's freaking bizarre right like you don't even know what to make of the ending of it and freaks and geeks it it ends kind of bittersweetly um but the fact that they didn't get a chance to formally wrap things up i mean freaks and geeks you know the ending they filmed way before most of the other episodes cuz they thought they were going to be canceled for sure <laughs> yeah. so they tried to come up with an ambiguous ending to be tied like that it's it's unfortunate it's unfortunate for them to have to be pressed like that but that's just the way things work you never know when you're going to get axed so you have to have some kind of backup ending and just in case so your fans really don't hate you of course and i mean like eh, to be honest i don't know if every show should be given that but then again Every show should be given a chance to wrap things up, or they shouldn't, right? You can't be, you can't have favoritism. Like I think Fringe was supposed to end off with um, Leonard Nimoy's, like the bad Leonard Nimoy character, like losing that last battle there. But then when yeah. they got renewed for another season, they could have went like that. That could have ended badly, but they picked off, they picked up with the Observer storyline, and then they ended it off like that, which was excellent in the future. That was crazy. I love that. Even if you haven't watched Fringe, I'm sure that doesn't make any sense, so you should still watch it. <laughs> yeah. Did you see that they released um, the coding? Like, you know, every episode has a, the coding. I can't remember the exact word for it, but it's like the images the, of like, the, the frogs. The glyphs, yeah. Yeah, the glyphs, yeah. They released the actual um, the alphabet, so now you can actually translate things like easily. Well, now. I think people were trying to figure that out like through when, that, when the show was actually going on. And they had like forums and stuff. I used to go on the forums and try to decode stuff. And like, there's an observer character in every single episode too yeah basically like the alien in south park they're in every single episode yeah <laughs> it's so so bizarre though because if you don't notice that at first it's like wow i'm as oblivious as they are <laughs> that was a great show i miss that show and i'm but i don't want them to restart it in any sh- shape form whatsoever that's the thing i don't remember what publication said it but they basically said when fringe went science fiction on tv went like that's pretty much it you can't top that you can't top X Files. You can't top um, Twilight Zone. Like even Lost, if you consider that science fiction, which it kind of is. Even if it did have like a bit of a of a cluster of hell at the end, um, I'm sure like one. It, I, I'm sure another TV show will come along down the road. There, there always will be something else that comes along down the road. But that that's pretty like up there. But can you really top what those shows have done? Like you had like a film noir um, with um, X Files. You had basically Homeland meets X Files with Fringe, like this huge terrorist organization combined with um, the obstruction of physics, which was really, really creative. Like the way that they they put things together like that. Um, Lost, of course, which is a very existential show. Like it, it's not even the fact that they're stuck on an island. That's not what the show was about. The show was the show was um, their experiences at, metaphysically being stuck stranded on an island and then you had twilight zone which every single episode was something radically different we could that- have a whole episode for lost i'd be down for that but i think we could. what you're saying now i think person of interest might be that show 
it's so relevant to to today that it's scary. It is relevant, but do you think it's on the same level as those where it just completely well, I, I destroyed? Won't, I, I won't think you will notice that until the show's over. Maybe. The same thing with like those shows. You don't notice that until it's over. Maybe. At the same time, they're like... I think pr- right now, if any show's, show has the candidacy for that, that it would be person of interest. Possibly, but I mean... It's relevant, that's the thing, but it's not... Well, it's breaking ground, of course, because it's of its relevancy and the fact that it prophesies what's happening now, but it it's not breaking the box quite the way that Fringe might have or quite the way that X-Files might have. You know what I mean? It's not like taking the viewer into something that they don't even know. Point, pers- uh, point of interest. Person of interest is just showing what's happening now, basically, cleverly, right? Um, because it's getting away with it, and it's showing like the inner workings of all this but it's not it's not doing like what science fiction has the capability of doing which is breaking the mold of what we can even understand of an art form you know what i mean i think it's blowing the minds of a lot of people though oh yeah but it's not it's not doing like we've seen stuff like person of interest before it's still really good at what it's doing right but we've seen that kind of thing before where it's it's prophesizing what's happening like no um yeah, Network did that, where it basically predicted what television was going to be like and, mm-hmm. and the media. The Wire even did that when it basically went into the newsroom and the media. And people, like reporters were actually saying, wow, this is actually the most accurate rendition of the media that I've ever seen in any, in any like entertainment form. And that's person of interest, but it's, it's great at showing what we are now, but it's not like it's what we know now so that's why we understand it fringe and x files took things that we couldn't even comprehend and even twin peaks they took things that we couldn't even comprehend and just went with it and it introduced us to like a whole new way of viewing something you know what i mean yeah but those things might not be actually real that's the thing though <laughs> that's the thing though like i think person of interest elevates it high but it's still it's still totally relevant Oh, it's relevant. That's the thing, yeah. but it's still not. It's not doing what those other shows are doing. Oh, so you want like straight up sci-fi, like not. There's not a chance in hell it could happen. That's the thing. I don't think so because. Well, then there, watch The Walking Dead. I have watched The Walking <laughs> oh, Dead. Okay. I'm, I'm not. I'm not all for it as other people are. I'm not, to be brutally honest. I, I think after season one, it got silly. I like that. I like it right now. Oh, a lot of people like it. I I, I know I'm the minority here, but um. Yeah, it just like it got really silly. Like the fact that they're looking for this girl for so long, they find her, and then that's it. They but you know, it's totally different from the comics, right? Like, oh yeah, of course. I still have to read the comics, and apparently the comics are it's like, fantastic. It's like totally different from the TV show, right? Like that that girl is like not dead. That's the thing, and I haven't read the comics, so I don't know. But oh, well, I've been told to. I just don't <laughs> have time to. Yeah. All right, so man, how do you want to wrap up this episode? Um, of dependency on technology. Well, clearly because we resorted to talking about things that we like technologically, um, <laughs> we are dependent on technology. There you go. There you go. It's, we are, and there's no solution to it. We should embrace technology. I guess so, but just in moderation. Yeah, just uh-huh. in moderation. You know how to control yourself. Uh, don't stare at a screen for more than 40 minutes and like look outside the window for like 10 minutes. Look at something green in the distance. And if you love a show that's ended, let let it stay that way. Watch the Blu-rays, but don't want, don't don't beg for a sequel. Pretty much. I mean, if you love the show, chances are you won't get sick of it if you rewatch it. Like I won't. All right. Where can everyone find you, Andreas? Well, all of you dependent folk that um, did I just say folk? All you dependent people that um, are glued into live in limbo could find me personally on twitter at andreas babs i am on twitter as well at sean chin the show is at live in limbo and you can use the hashtags capsule podcast to join in on the conversation please subscribe to this podcast because we love you on itunes like itunes is where you should get this podcast and of yep. course you should uh, read the co- uh, show notes at live slash capsule and we'll have all the juicy links to everything that we talked about here today. Including St. Vincent, which is the most necessary. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, no. you have to listen to that album. Yes, you must. It's fantastic. All right. Take care. Yep. See you later. <laughs>